Warren couldn't stay out of the headlines while news leaked of Green reportedly almost coming to blows with Lauren Boebert. All this as the former president still has a chokehold on his party. His endorsed candidates are repeating his big election lie, a tactic that might win them some primaries, but also may end up costing them in November. First off, folks, let me be very clear tonight. The election in 2020 was rigged and stolen. Former President Donald Trump continues to talk about the 2020 election. Is it time for the Republican Party to move forward? I had discussed with President Trump, and we cannot move on. With us tonight, Mara Gay, who's part of the New York Times editorial board. She is also an MSNBC contributor. And Tim Miller, a contributor to The Bulwark and the former communications director for Jeb Bush. His new book, Why We Did It, comes out June 28th. So, Tim, I'm not sure we have enough time to enumerate all the controversies enveloping Madison Cawthorn. Uh, what, being detained for bringing a loaded gun to an airport again, charged with driving with a revoked license again, falsely accusing his colleagues of cocaine-fueled orgies, and then, of course, Marjorie Taylor Greene, et cetera. How much do these fringe candidates and the headlines they generate hurt the Republican Party? Thanks, Chris, and I, I appreciate the book reveal. I feel I wrote why we did it because I feel like every time I'm on one of these shows, somebody in your seat is asking me, "What? Ha why did the Republicans go so crazy? What happened? Like, what are these guys doing?" And so I, I, I want to explain it, and I, I did my best in longer than a two-minute segment in the book. Um, and uh, here's the thing: uh, these guys, the Cawthorns and the Greens. I've got some bad news for the Democrats. Their craziness is not going to be the thing that, that allows the Democrats to control the House and the Senate in November. It's just not. Voters are not going to vote on what somebody in some other district said that's crazy when they're concerned about gas prices and other things in their day-to-day -day lives. Here's what could matter, though, those second clips. The clips of the candidates that Republicans are nominating that are absolutely insane for secretary of state, governor, senator, across swing states in places like Michigan, Michigan, Pennsylvania. In, in Michigan, just last weekend, they, they nominated two people who are, uh, you know, far right, like my pillow level QAnon conspirators in, in, in how much they want to talk about the 2020 election being fraudulent. That is not going to work. And, and I think when the Democrats can do what Jamie Raskin was doing, if they can run ads about the actual candidates on the ballot, not Donald Trump, not people in other states, but the candidates on the ballot in their states, and say, these people aren't going to help you with inflation. All these people want to talk about is Donald Trump's fantasies and conspiracies about the last election that led to January 6th, that could have an impact. And I think that nominating those candidates are, 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 is a big risk for Republicans in what is otherwise a good political environment for them. And, and yet, Mara, many Republicans want to label Democrats as the radicals. And earlier today, Matthew Dowd said that characterization of this big lurch left is simply not accurate. Take a listen. If you think about the center of the country, let's call it the St. Louis suburbs, the center of the country. Let's grant that the Democrats might have moved to Kansas City, not far away, but might have moved to Kansas City. The Republicans have left the United States and have moved to Hungary and, or moved to Russia. He argues, Mara, that one party has gotten much more extreme, and it's not the Democrats, but, and this is the but, Republicans are just better at their messaging. Is he right? I have to completely agree. I would also say that the Virginia gubernatorial election uh, last time around, I think, is very instructive as a, a, a word of warning for Democrats, which is to say that, you know, I think Democrats need to stop using the language of Republican of the Republican Party to defend themselves and to get their message to Americans. They seem to be in constant uh, reaction mode to whatever Republicans are accusing them of. So it's like a schoolyard threat. Uh, you know, you're, you're a radical. No, no, you're the radical one. And I think the Democrats really need to kind of pull back a second and ask themselves what their narrative is, what their story is, what their message is to the American people. And they should really focus on that rather than constantly reacting to whatever message. But do they uh, have a message? Have. What is that message? Do they have a message? Great question. They have a lot of policies that can help the American people, and they are the only party right now uh, that is deeply committed to democracy, and that's a problem. Um, you know, I certainly don't come on these shows to defend the Democratic Party or offer them advice. Uh, I, that's not my interest. And yet, 
there is only one party in the United States right now that is committed to democracy. And so they really need to uh, turn their policies into a productive message that they can deliver on. And it's a very difficult environment when all politics is local. And, you know, in these swing districts, okay, it's not going to be decided on Madison Cawthorn. It's going to be decided on, again, gas prices, on uh, issues closer to home, the pandemic, uh, the inflation crisis. So I think that the Democrats uh, should stop reacting and they should start getting their message straight. Well, let's look at one example, Tim, that I think a lot of people are examining to see where this is going. Ohio, J.D. Vance. Of course, yeah. his numbers surged with Trump's endorsement, but Republican challenger Mac Dolan is keeping the race pretty competitive, and there are still a lot of undecideds. How do you read that race now? And maybe more to the point of this conversation, what will the outcome of that primary tell us about the power of Trump and the state of the Republican Party? I, I don't know that the outcome is going to tell us that much because we know that right now the, the Trump has a plurality support within the party. What's happening in Ohio is that, is that Dolan, who's running as, you know, maybe your traditional mild boss, Jeb Bush kind of Republican, uh, is one of five candidates. And then there are four candidates that are like MAGA light, you know, MAGA premium, MAGA extra, extra premium. And, you know, then you have J.D. Vance, who's, you know, sucking up to Donald Trump's kids and, have, and, and campaigning with Marjorie Taylor Greene. He's the one that is in the lead right now. I think it's possible possible that Dolan could sneak through because it's a five-way race. I think that if you're an independent in Ohio watching the show right now, I would support, I would support Dolan's candidacy in that primary. I think it's more likely that Vance, uh, you know, as the, as the MAGA extra, extra premium, will end up winning. And then he is going to be up against Tim Ryan, who is a center-left, kind of old-school Bill Clinton-style union Democrat. I, I think that is the kind of contrast that Democrats need. I think for Democrats to have a chance, they need to attack the Republicans as being outside the mainstream, too conspiratorial, too concerned about Donald Trump, not concerned about inflation, and then run on pocketbook issues themselves. If it's Vance versus Ryan, that could be a good example for where it works out for Democrats in Ohio. Other states might not be looking quite as good. And before we go in our closing minute, Mara, I want to ask you about the 30th anniversary today of the start of the L.A. riots. Your most recent Times piece argues that the discourse around race and policing is still stuck in the 90s. There had been so much conversation about moving forward. Is this an issue Democrats, again, need to have clear messaging on, what, three decades after the crime bill? I think it is. Um, there, you know, we do have an issue in, in cities across America with uh, crime on the rise. For and the voters first time, care about it. They've made it clear, land. right? They, they, the problem is, I think, that in my view, uh, mayors and others need to be talking about getting guns off the street and about professionalizing America's police departments and also holding them accountable so that we can actually have some trust um, from citizens to the police departments um, and, and vice versa. So I think, you know, the problem here with Mayor Adams' message is he's defending, he's been defending some old school policies that really have not been proven to be effective um, and have shown e extreme uh, levels of collateral damage in black and brown communities across America for generations. So there's, a, there's this idea out there that you have to have aggressive policing or allow police departments to do whatever they like uh, with no accountability, or we're going to have mayhem in the streets. Mm. And that is both an ineffective way to keep people safe because it doesn't work, and it's extremely harmful. So we have to really, uh, we have to get this right. We have to do better. Margay, Tim Miller, thank you both. Coming up, the immediate humanitarian needs of Ukrainian refugees in Poland is one crisis. The lasting psychological trauma is another. Dr. Erwin Redlander is just back from Poland and joins us next when the 11th hour continues.